going to be bringing our two Bible readings for us today. Um, if you'd like to follow along with the readings, uh, and you forgot to pick up a Bible or you don't have one with you, just put up your hand and Steve will give you one. And I'll give you a minute to uh, look up the first passage because it's only short and you don't want to come in halfway through and miss all the good stuff. Um, so as you see on the overhead, our first passage is Isaiah 12. And if you've got one of those um, Bibles that the church provides, it's on page 563. So page 563 on these Bibles, Isaiah chapter 12, and I'm going to be reading the whole chapter, which is pretty short, but it's really good. Um, coming into Christmas, of course, we will hear a number of Bible passages from Isaiah. Many of the prophecies about Jesus coming are found in the, in the books of Isaiah. We don't really know what, how much Isaiah really understood of the prophecies that he was making and the words that he was given. What we do know is a lot of it got him really excited about what was coming. And here's one example. Isaiah chapter 12 from verse 1. In that day you will say, I will praise you, Lord, although you were angry with me, your anger has turned away, and you have comforted me. Surely God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. The Lord, the Lord himself, is my strength and my defence. He has become my salvation. With joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. In that day you will say, Give praise to the Lord. Proclaim his name, make known among the nations what he has done, and proclaim that his name is exalted. Sing to the Lord, for he has done glorious things. Let this be known to all the world. Shout aloud and sing for joy, people of Zion, for great is the Holy One of Israel among you. Our second reading is from... Uh, the book of Luke in the New Testament. And if you've got one of the church Bibles, you'll find that on page 830. Luke chapter 1. Now, if you've read ahead, you might know what's happened just before the passage that I'm going to read. But if you haven't, this is very much a matter of when last we left our heroes. Let me just fill you in. A priest of the Lord has been serving in the temple and he sees an angel. And the angel says to him, your wife is going to give birth to a child. The priest, whose name is Zechariah, says, is this some sort of joke? I'm really old. My wife Elizabeth is really old. We're too old to have children. The angel says, this is a promise made to you from the Lord. It will happen. And shortly thereafter, the priest's wife, Elizabeth, becomes pregnant. Fade out. Fade in to a different scenario. And we're starting in Luke chapter 1 at verse 26. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favoured. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favour with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. 
The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who was said to be unable to conceive is now in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. At that time, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea, where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favoured that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord would fulfil his promises to her. And Mary said, My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Saviour. For he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the Mighty One has gra done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but he has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. Mary stayed with Elizabeth for about three months, and then she returned home. Oh, thanks, Rex. Keep your Bibles open in Luke chapter 1. Uh, it's great to be here this morning. Good morning to you, particularly if you're new with us or visiting today. My name's Joel. I'm a student minister here at Wente, and it is good to be here this morning uh, to open up God's Word um, for us today. Uh, we're going to be continuing in our Christmas series, How to Sing at Christmas, and that's where we're thinking about what stirs and fuels our hearts at Christmas time to help us to sing at Christmas time. Now, Christmas, it's a strange season in Australia because it's a time when Australians love to sing together. Normally, Australians aren't very... We're not a big singing kind of country unless it's chanting at the footy match or belting out Bohemian Rhapsody at your friend's birthday party. We really don't like to sing together. But there's something about Christmas where Australians, even Andrew, loves to sing. <laughs> uh, what, what's going on? And particularly, it's, it's strange because... For a society that's moving further and further away from the things of Jesus and rejecting the message of the Bible, we're, we're seeing songs that are all about Jesus and all about God's wonderful good news to the world. Don't you find that weird? Isn't that remarkable? What do you think is going on? Well, perhaps it is uh, that the Christmas time reminds people of time of celebration with family and friends. It's a time of joy, of presents and uh, good food. And so these Christmas carols are just reminders of times of family. And perhaps too, it's, it's the end of the year. And so uh, the Christmas carols remind us of there's been a year that's happened and we've got a new start ahead of us. I want to probably all those things stir our hearts in Christmas, but I want to suggest that it's actually something fundamental about the Christmas story itself. Something about the story of Jesus, God's son born into the world, to come and save sinners, that stirs people's hearts at Christmas time, even when people don't necessarily understand or believe what they're singing about in these Christmas carols. Because 
what these Christmas carols hold out to us is light in the darkness, hope for the hopeless. They offer the promise of redemption and joy to those who are lowly and humble. We saw that in my favourite carol that we sung before, O Holy Night. Uh, listen to these words again from O Holy Night. Long lay the world in sin and error pining, till he appeared and the soul felt its worth. A thrill of hope, the weary world rejoices, for yonder breaks a new and glorious morn. Don't those lyrics just capture a sense of hope for the hopeless, a sense of a new beginning, a new start, a sense of joy for those who have had a hard time. See, I think it's this feeling of humble joy that we get, that Australians get when we sing Christmas songs together, this joy of, and joy and, and, and perhaps even uh, a distant hope of, of the future where we maybe experience joy and, and blessedness and redemption that Australians are longing for at Christmas time. I think that certainly stirs the hearts of Christians at Christmas time. It's a humble joy in the promises of God, a humble joy concerning the God who's shown us so much favour. This is actually the essence of the Christian experience. It's the, uh, what it means to have a real and living relationship with the Lord Jesus. We're going to see today, how do we sing at Christmas? We're going to see we sing with humble joy before a gracious God, because of a God who's so, shown us so much favour. That's our main idea today. That's what we're going to see. And as we look in the Bible, in Luke chapter 1, God's going to show us that through the story of Mary and her song, he's going to show us that we sing with humble joy because of a God who's shown us so much grace. So three points that, that should be on the screen. Um, three points today. We've got uh, we are humble, we are joyful, and then the key to humble joy. That's how we're going to unpack this idea of God showing us so much grace and we respond with humble joy. Let me pray for us again as we come before God's word. Father, please soften our hearts. Please give us humility and please let us listen carefully to your glorious words. Please, Lord, help us to behold the Lord Jesus and your goodness to us in him and to respond in humble, trembling, delightful joy. In Jesus' name, amen. So come to your Bibles in Luke chapter 1. We come to a backcountry village called Nazareth in Galilee, and we come to the room of a young woman, a virgin betrothed to a man named Joseph, and she's there in a room. Perhaps she's curling her hair or doing some wedding planning, but she's there alone in a room, but then there's an unexpected sudden visitor with some surprising news. Look at verse 28. An angel appears, and the angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favoured, the Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid. Mary, you have found favour with God. Wow, can you imagine this? A peasant girl in a backwater country town, young, unmarried, of low social standing, a nobody. But the divine herald the mighty herald of the divine king appears to her, an angel of God with a message. And she's terrified. She's trembling. What's going on? A supernatural being is before her. But Mary has no reason to fear because she has found favor with the divine king. The angel literally says to her, you have found grace with God. God has looked upon Mary and for no reason other than out of his own kindness has shown her favor. He has a gift for her. That's what the word grace means. It means a free gift out of someone's kindness. Now, what, what has God done for Mary? Well, take a look at verse 31. The angel continues, You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. Well, do you see what Mary's being told here? She's being told that God's promised long-awaited king, the king who would come in the line of David, the king who would restore the people of God, who would defeat God's enemies and would bring peace and justice and righteousness to the world, the king who would be God's very own son, the divine king, is going to be Mary's child. Mary's going to be the mother of the Messiah. 
Isn't that remarkable? And it's quite astounding and confusing for Mary, particularly because she's wondering, how am I going to conceive this child? I'm not married. Uh, but God, the maker of life, the one who created all things, will miraculously cause life to conceive in her womb. Not through a man, but through the Holy Spirit. That's what the angel tells her in verse 35. And this child will truly be the Son of God. Well, how strange and unexpected is this great gift to Mary? And what's Mary's response? Well, she sings about God's surprising gift to her in her song. Skip over to verse 48 to Mary's song. She says, For God has been mindful of the humble state of his servant, and from now on all generations will call me blessed. For the Mighty One has done great things for me. Holy is his name. And Mary knows that this kind of surprising act of kindness from God to her is just the sort of thing that her God would do. This is consistent with who God is. And so she continues singing in verse 50, His mercy extends to those who fear him. From generation to generation, he has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down the rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. See, this is the pattern of our God. This is the pattern of the real God, the God who's really there. He is a God who loves to show mercy and favor and kindness to the poor and lowly. He loves to show, offer redemption and forgiveness to the humble. He loves to offer hope to the hopeless. Yet God, he can't stand the proud. He can't stand the arrogant. He can't stand evildoers and the wicked. He will bring them down. And isn't this what we long for at a time like Christmas? Isn't that this something what our world longs for? We want, we want the wicked and the proud taken down. We want hope for the humble. We want uh, the lowly to be lifted up. And isn't the Christmas story such a vivid display of this uh, hope, God's grace to the humble? You see, the infinite God who created the world, the unlimited God who made human beings, actually becomes a limited human being himself. The divine king becomes a little baby in the care of a peasant girl, a little embryo. The saviour of the world is little legs kicking inside of Mary's stomach. And this baby will grow up to suffer and die for the sake of sinners. He would, Jesus will grow up to suffer and die to be crucified on the cross so that the humble may find favour and peace with God. That is what we are longing for, really, in our hearts, isn't it? But we need to be clear who the humble are. See, it's not the sports star who doesn't celebrate after scoring a great try, and it's not the rich CEO who only shops at Kmart, it's not the, the lady who helps her friends move houses, and it's not even the world-class surgeon who donates his skills and his time and even risks his life offering medical support in a war zone. Those are all great acts of commendable good deeds, but none of those are true humility. None of those are the kind of humility that God is looking for. See, what God is looking for is people who are humble towards him, who are trusting in him. Like in verse 50 when Mary sings, his mercy extends to those who fear him, those who respect him, those who worship him as their God. See, you may be the generous, world-class surgeon donating all your time. You may be someone who uh, never speaks about your skills or your gifts. You may be someone who often helps out your friends, but you can do all that while remaining proud before God. You can do all that while still failing to listen to God, while still failing to obey God, while still ignoring him and putting yourself above God. And that actually is the height of arrogance and wicked pride, isn't it? True humility is to trust God, to listen to him, to obey him, to be humbled before a gracious God. And that's Mary's response, isn't it? Come to verse 38. Mary responds and she says, I am the Lord's servant. May your word to me be fulfilled. 
Friends, the response to a gracious God is to be humble before him. It's the person who admits their sin and failure to love God, who acknowledges that he and only he is worthy of their devotion. It's to listen to and submit to God's word in the Bible. It's the person who gives their life over to the rule and care of Jesus. That is true humility. That is the humility that God will favour and bless. Are you humble before God? Will you humble yourself before God? Only then will you find favour and grace with him. And friends, being a humble servant of God, it's certainly not dull or dreary or depressing, but it actually is wonderfully joyful. We turn to our second point now. We are joyful. Now, as we come back to the story of Mary here, we come to verse 39, and Mary hurries off to visit her relative Elizabeth, someone who's also been favoured by God. And as Rex pointed out, the first half of chapter 1 recounts God promising Elizabeth, who's an old and infertile woman, unable to have children, uh, that she will actually miraculously conceive with her husband Zechariah. And she'll, her child will be the one who will prepare the way for God's coming king, who will prepare the way for the divine Messiah. And this baby's name will be John. We know him as John the Baptist. Now, the angel had told Mary about that in verse 36, because uh, I imagine to encourage Mary to trust in God's promises. And so perhaps Mary is off to visit Elizabeth now to visit for some confirmation and encouragement. And I I imagine, to, to celebrate together God's goodness and favour and grace to both of them. And that's exactly what happens. Come to verse 41. As Mary enters into Elizabeth's house, verse 41, when Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favoured that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who has received, who have believed the, that the Lord would fulfill his promises to her. Don't Elizabeth's words just leap out at us joyfully like the leaping baby in a womb. There's celebration, there's excitement, there's just awe and wonder over God's goodness and favour. And the word blessed is just painted all over this scene. Elizabeth calls Mary blessed. Now, we use this word blessed a lot today, don't we? Uh, the word blessed here, all it just means is to be favoured by God. The word blessed just means to have God's eyes set upon you to bestow his blessings and kindness and favour. Now, before we continue in the story, I just want to make a quick comment about Mary being called the blessed mother of the Lord. Uh, she is rightfully celebrated here because of God's surprising kindness to her, but some churches have misunderstood what this means and have have actually made Mary into a divine person. They've, they've actually made Mary into someone that uh, people pray to, and that is almost equal to with God. And I think that's actually completely confused the point. In, in fact, Mary is just like you and I. She's just a, a, a weak, humble sinner who's just as in need of God's mercy and forgiveness as anyone else. And I think if Mary were around today, she'd be appalled that, that people would pray to her. She'd say to us, don't revere me, but revere the God who favoured me and offers you favour too. She'd say to us, don't marvel at me, but marvel at the child I bore. She'd say, yes, look to my example of humble trust in God, but don't trust in me. Trust in the son I bore, who is my Lord and Saviour too, who died for me. It's only in him that I am truly blessed. So we mustn't mistake Mary being under God's favour for being some special divine woman. She is just someone like you and I who's received the kindness of God. Okay, let's come back to the scene here. There's joy, celebration. Elizabeth is ecstatic. The baby John is already fulfilling his task to prepare the way for the Lord Jesus. And then Mary herself bursts into joyous song. See, the point here is joy is the natural response to God's startling grace, isn't it? See, we, we know that. When you and I witness a surprising act of kindness, maybe to us or we, we see it in someone else's lives, that just fills us with, with a, a deep, humble joy. Perhaps it's when your friend cooks you a meal after you've had a terrible day at work. 
Or perhaps it's the church member who leaves money in your mailbox when you've just been struggling financially. Oh, you know you don't deserve that sort of kindness, but you feel so loved. You feel such sweet, precious, humble joy. How much more when we consider God's grace and favour to us in the Lord Jesus, that he would come and lay down his life for us who are undeserving of his grace and mercy? What sweet, precious, humbling joy that brings. Yet joy, it's not just the response to God's favour along with humility, but actually being humble towards God, it, being humble itself swells and creates up more joy in us. See, that's what Elizabeth is saying to Mary in verse 45, when she says, blessed is she who has believed. That word blessed literally means to be happy. Happy is the one who trusts in the Lord. The state of being humble before God isn't dull and dreary. The state of trusting in him and submitting to him isn't a killjoy, but it's where real happiness is found. That is the real blessed life. Oh, don't we know how profoundly freeing it is to not be so caught up in yourself and your own advancement and your own glory? I know how draining it is for me, how much I, I'm weighed down with my own bit of pride. But to forget myself and to be consumed by the glory of Jesus' love, that is true happiness. To stop living for myself and to live for Jesus' sake, that is really living Friends, if you trust in Jesus, you are abundantly blessed. What favour you have received. God has saved you even though you deserved his judgment. And every honour and blessing and glory that belongs to Jesus is now shared with you. It's now yours too because of him. You are highly favoured in the Lord Jesus. Wow, what joy, what happiness we have as Christians because of God's favour to us. Isn't that remarkable? Yet we so often struggle to match the reality of God's grace with our experiences, don't we? Instead of sweet delight drinking in from the deep wells of humble joy, we trudge through the mud of bitterness, envy and despair, all the symptoms of pride, all the symptoms of failing to truly melt under the goodness of God, all the symptoms of still being proud towards God in our heart. But it doesn't have to be this way. It mustn't be this way if you've found favour with the Lord Jesus because God has given us the key to unending springs of humble joy. And that's what we turn to now, our third point, the key to humble joy. So how do we foster and experience humble joy? How do we sing with humble joy, not just in those fleeting moments at Christmas for a brief moment when we're trying to grasp onto a feeling, but how do we make the feeling and experience of humble joy, of peace with God, a reality to us always and every day through every season of life, no matter the sorrow and despair that comes even despite and through bitter tears, how do we experience humble joy before God? Well, Mary's song provides the key. Listen to Mary sing in verse 46. My soul glorifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Saviour. See, the word glorifies there, in the original Greek, it literally means to magnify Mary says that her soul, her very being, in response to God's grace, is magnifying the Lord. Now, the word magnify just means to make something big. There's two kinds of magnifying. The first kind is the magnifying glass kind. That's when you take something that's really tiny, and like perhaps an ant or a bug, and you put the magnifying glass over it, and you make it appear a lot bigger than it really is. That is not the kind of magnifying that Mary's talking about here and that the Bible talks about as well. Now, the kind of magnifying that Mary's talking about is the second kind. It's the telescope kind. It's when there's something that might appear small, but it's actually really big, and it just appears small because it's far in the distance. Perhaps it's like the stars or the moon, and so you take this telescope and you look up at it, and you actually begin to see it more clearly and fully for what it really is. And we know all the uh, magnificent um, high-tech telescopes that we have today barely can blow up what the moon really is to a fraction. So that's the kind of magnifying that Mary's talking about here, to make something that is really big appear for what it really is. Now, 
That is the key to humble joy, to magnify Jesus, to behold him truly, to make him great in your life, to know him for who he really is, to see his glorious greatness. That's why glorify is a fitting translation. So often we, we only see Jesus from a distance. We only see God from a distance, but we are to reflect upon him and behold his glory for who he truly is. It's like when you gaze up at the stars. I'm sure we've all had this experience and you just imagine, wow, these small little stars are actually so much bigger than I could ever imagine. That just brings you awe and wonder and it brings you great humility and it brings a great joy. That's what we are to do with the Lord Jesus, the most magnificent and precious person, magnificent being in all of existence. That's the heart of Mary's song. That's what it means for us to praise God. And did you notice the connection between Mary rejoicing in God and magnifying him? See, we magnify Jesus, we make him great um, in our lives by rejoicing in him as our greatest treasure, by finding our happiness in him. And we rejoice in Jesus as we get a clearer and more fuller picture of who he truly is. Magnifying Jesus, making him great and seeing him fully is the key to eternal springs of humble joy. It's what we were made for. So I want to suggest three practices to help us turn that key and magnify Jesus. The first one is the most fundamental way to see Jesus more clearly and fully. It's to humbly listen to God in the Bible, to humbly reflect upon God's words in the Bible, to read and contemplate the Bible. We see in Mary's story that she pondered and reflected upon God's words and promises to her, and she burst out in joyous song. Her soul magnified the Lord. So as we humbly come before God in the Bible, the first step to humble ourselves before him, we see a few things. First, as we truly listen to God, we see ourselves rightly. We see that we are uh, but God's creatures. Every um, breath that we have is owed to him. And we see too that we are wicked sinners who've, instead of loving and respecting our God, we've disobeyed him, we've ignored him, we've been proud towards him. And that, that is terrible. And, and we also see that this God is actually holy and magnificent. He is actually perfectly good. He's righteous. He's just. He is wise. He is wonderful and marvelous. And that combination of seeing ourselves as guilty sinners before him and seeing him as the wise, awesome, just God is actually terrifying. It's actually profoundly despairing because we see that we deserve God's judgment. It brings shame and despair because we realize we are guilty of treating God so horribly. It's crushing, isn't it? That is dreadfully humbling. Yet, though it is essential that we must see that first and feel that, we mustn't stop there. To truly be humbly listening to God, we must continue to see that this same God is full of mercy and compassion that he time and time again shows forgiveness to his people and favour to those who have rejected him, to those who come and humble themselves before him who say, I'm sorry. We see this magnified, clear and enlarged in his son Jesus, don't we? We see it in the Christmas story that the extraordinary lengths that God would go to save a sinful people, the eternal son born into a rebellious world, the king of the universe, he came into an animal cave. And this son, he didn't grow up in palaces, dining with the rich. No, he grew up dining with the sinners and the tax collectors. He actually came to live, to suffer and die and be crucified for the sake of you and I. Even worse, he faced the terrible judgment of God, his father, in our place. Isn't that wonderful mercy and kindness from God? When we truly grasp that, when we truly see that clearly and fully, oh, our hearts melt, don't they? Tears flow, knees bow down, arms lift up, voices cry out, our souls glorify the Lord, and our spirit rejoices in God our Saviour. Doesn't that just melt your heart as we magnify Jesus by pondering the Bible? So, friends, brothers and sisters, we must spend time humbly reflecting on God's word, 
see and feel and love the greatness of Jesus so that you see him clearly, you magnify him, and you will experience the springs of humble joy. Now, the second thing is, like Mary, to sing praise. See, praising God in song is profoundly powerful. Mary responds in the song. She just bursts in the song as the fitting response to what God has done for her. But the, the process is not just a fitting response, but it's actually what helps fan into flames our joy in Jesus. See, even in seasons of dryness, as we sing songs that are soaked in Scripture that are all about the goodness of Jesus, that show us our sin and our great God, yet yeah, His mercy too, well, that just fuels a fire in our hearts to greater love and adoration to the Lord Jesus. The very act of praising God fires up our hearts with joy in Jesus. And when we're doing it together, like when we gather here for church, well, we just make Jesus great for each other. So I want to encourage each of us to express and fuel your humble joy with wholehearted singing, with belting out these beautiful tunes that we sing, maybe raising your hands, maybe clapping along, whatever you want to do. The most important thing is that you uh, stir up your own heart and encourage each other by wholehearted praise to the Lord Jesus. It's good for you, it's good for others, and it helps you have a greater joy in Christ. The third thing to help us magnify Jesus and experience humble joy, not just at Christmas time but all the time, is to celebrate Jesus in each other. It's to honour others. Now, be honest, how often do you compete and compare yourself with others? How often do you feel weighed down with jealousy and envy, even jealousy over God's work in the lives of other people? Elizabeth, she must have been tempted to envy. See, she was pregnant with John the Baptist, but Mary was pregnant with the very Son of God. But any envy that Elizabeth may have had was put to death when she honoured and celebrated God's work in Mary's life. See, honouring others, celebrating God's work in other people's lives, heals off envy, it helps us have a greater appreciation of Jesus and brings to life sweet, humble joy. Because to honour others, you stop being obsessed with yourself and you become more enamoured with God's goodness so that even when you feel like you're missing out, even when you feel like you wish you were as successful or popular or skillful or whatever it is as someone else, to, to honour them, you celebrate God's goodness in their lives and Jesus becomes more real to you. Elizabeth literally celebrated Mary, um, Jesus inside of Mary we are to celebrate and honour Jesus being formed spiritually in each of us. So even today, perhaps even over morning tea, why don't you go up to someone, think about someone, maybe particularly if there's someone that you have tensions with, this is a great way to build um, broken relationships and, and have joy in those friendships. But why don't you think about someone, how they're reflecting Jesus in their life, and go tell them. It'll be encouraging for you, for them, and I promise you, it will stir up humble joy in you and a greater praise for Christ. So why don't you go do that over morning tea? So what have we seen today as we've been thinking about how do we sing at Christmas? We sing at Christmas with humble joy because of a gracious God who's shown us so much faith. And that key to true peace and happiness that our society is trying to grasp and look for at Christmas time that stirs our hearts at Christmas time. Well, in Jesus, we have it. We have it. We know that we must be humbled by the grace of God to get lost in the glory of the love of Jesus, to stop trying to squint to see your own pretend glory, but to truly behold the greatness of Christ's love for you. That's how we sing at Christmas. That's how we sing in all seasons. That's how we live. That's what stirs our hearts. And this is what the Christmas story will do for you if you would only humble yourself before a gracious God, before the glorious and kind God who's shown us so much favour in Jesus Christ, who we praise with humble joy. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we are so astounded by your goodness. We are so astounded by your mercy. We are so astounded by your compassion and kindness to us. We are so undeserving. We know that we are wicked. And if we truly are honest with ourselves and listen to you, we see that we don't deserve anything good from you. 
but only your judgment. Yet you have shown us such grace and favor and kindness by sending your son, Lord, the Lord Jesus, to die for us. And we see your humility and your love for us as he's born into our world, as we remember that at Christmas time. Please help us to see him as for who he truly is, clearly and fully as we magnify him, with pondering your word, with praising you and honoring each other, so that we may magnify the Lord Jesus with our humble joy. In Jesus' name, amen.